And so this uh, lecture and the next lecture we're going to be reviewing some networking concepts. Uh, you may already know these, you may not, uh, but in any case this will put us all on the same page. Uh, the particular concepts that we're going to talk about are IP addresses, uh, the domain name system, something called time to live, and ports in this lecture. So let's start by talking about IP. Uh, IP stands for Internet Protocol and that's a label that identifies a particular device on the Internet. I'll talk about what device means in a minute. Uh, IPv4 is 32 bits long and gives a four number sequence with dots in the middle. It turns out that 32 bits wasn't enough and so IPv6 was created in 1995 and it has 128 bits. Uh, uh, the uptake of IPv6 has been very slow. Um, the IPv4 numbers have been exhausted, but there are techniques, which we'll see in a minute, uh, uh, to, to extend them, especially inside virtual uh, uh, clouds and, and, and other types of platforms like that. Uh, and so more people are converting to IPv6. Um, Google keeps track of the percentage of users that access uh, Google over IPv6, and, and on the first blush, this, this looks like you know a, a really growing number. But if you look at the y-axis, you see that it 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 so far it's up to about 18 to 20 percent, something like that. So it's still not a huge amount in terms of IPv6, and that's assuming that Google is representative of of the kind of traffic you have. So when I say every device on the internet, that means things like virtual machines in a cloud uh, or inside an application such as VirtualBox. Um, it also these days means uh, uh, what's called IoT, Internet of Things, so things like your refrigerator and, and your toaster and so on, if they're internet enabled, have IP addresses. Uh, for our purposes, every virtual machine gets an IP address when it's created. And these IP addresses can be private and not seen outside of the cloud or a particular application. Or they can be public and directly addressable from outside the cloud. Uh, there are some addresses that are used uh, by convention. So 127.0.0.1 is your physical machine. That's, that's a convention that's used. It's also called localhost. Uh, 192 is the prefix for a private network and so every virtual machine gets its own or virtual machine host gets its own set of 192 numbers and it can assign them the way they want. This is one way that the IPv4 has been extended. Every IP message has a header and a payload and the header includes the address of the source and the destination. This is true in IPv4. It's also true in IPv6. And so, so what? So this uh, allows for a certain amount of uh, what game playing in terms of IP addresses. So if machine A sends a message to machine B, which IP message, so it, it's it's a header plus a payload, then a gateway, if this goes through a particular router or gateway, can make it look like the message comes from the gateway. So it changes the source IP address and so as far as the recipient is concerned it's coming from from the gateway. Why, why is this of interest? Because the recipient will respond to the message and it responds to the the source of the message. So in this case if, if this type of game is being played, it would respond to the gateway. And now the gateway has to know what to do with it, so the gateway has to have a table so that it can pass it back, uh, pass the response back to IPA. Uh, each virtual machine manager is given a range of IP addresses given by the people that assign IP. There, there, there's a whole organizational structure that I don't want to get into. Uh, and it can assign these to virtual machine instance. Uh, one complication is that the assignment lasts only as long as the instance does. 
and so if the instance goes away then the particular IP address that that virtual machine has been assigned can be reassigned. Uh, and messages that come from the virtual machine instance come from the assigned IP address and then the recipient can respond directly to the address. One complication in the cloud is that you may respond to a virtual machine that no longer exists and its IP has has uh, been reassigned and so that's a complication that uh, cloud providers worry about. Okay, so that, that so much for IP addresses. What about domain name system? So the domain name system works on URLs. So we know what URLs are. That's the thing you put in the top of your browser. You know, mse.cmu.edu, for example. And that the your browser sends that URL to uh, uh, the domain name system server which responds with an IP address so it looks it up in a table uh, finds out what IP address it is sends the IP address back to your browser and your browser sends a message directly to the IP address not surprisingly this is uh, not a very realistic picture uh, so the picture shows a single uh, domain name system server and actually there are lots of them there's a hierarchy of them uh, it shows a single line going from the client to the server with the IP address there's actually a network of routers to transmit messaging messages and and the transmit that that's pretty complicated in terms of how the message actually gets to the to the server but let's go into the hierarchy based on the URL names. So consider www.mse.isr.cmu.edu. If you had one server and had all the domain names, um, had all, and it, it, it satisfied all these requests, then it would get overloaded because everybody would be beating on it, and it would have over 200 million mappings, which is the current. Uh, uh, population of, 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 of URLs and so it's arranged as a hierarchy and and the hierarchy is as you might guess based on the reading right to left uh, on the dots so there is an authoritative name server that holds all of the final suffixes so it holds AU for Australia EDU for education dot com uh, for various countries and so on and it's replicated so uh, this is for performance reasons. So let's look in more detail about how we find www.mse and so on. So we start with the root server. This is the authoritative server. server. There are 13 of these things. Uh, they have known IP addresses and the known IP addresses are built into the browser. So this is uh, f you know, reasonably difficult to change. Uh, so you access the root server to get the IP address of the .edu. Then you go to the .edu through using its IP address to get the IP address of the .cmu.edu, and so on. And eventually you get to a DNS server that is under local control. So the MSE DNS server is under the control of ISR, the www. Uh, uh, in front of the MSE. That's another server that's under the control of the MSE program. And this allows MSE to change the IP of the various local servers without changing anything up the hierarchy. It, it gives them flexibility. Okay, now moving to something called time to live. Uh, if you were paying attention when you looked at the IP4 protocol, there's something called time to live, uh, also an IP V6, I, I think. Uh, that has nothing to do with what we're about to talk about, so this is kind of confusing in terms of the thing time to live. So the time to live in our uh, context refers to how long does the DNS IP mapping live. So if you want to go to an authoritative server in your browser, since the authoritative server isn't going to change very much, you don't want to go to it every time. And so associated with the 
.edu in your browser as it looks up where .edu is, there is something called a time to live. How long does this entry, it, can I assume that this entry is valid? And then the browser will cache it and it won't have to look it up anymore. It's also called a refresh interval in, in some terminology. Um, and so the client uh, caches this IP address and these entries are valid for however long the time to live is. The value of the time to live depends where in the hierarchy the record is. High in the hierarchy, the authoritative servers, they're not going to change much and so time to lives are set to 24 hours. When you get down to things that are under local control, time to live can be set on the order of minutes. Well this is going to be important when we talk about moving environments inside uh, the uh, one of the DevOps topics that we're going to talk about. So we'll see applications of of, of uh, small TTL settings. Okay, and then finally, let's talk about ports. So if you watch old, I don't, I don't know that these things exist anymore. But if you watch old movies, you see switchboards. So you have a hotel, it has a switchboard, or you have a business that has a switchboard. The switchboard has an operator. Somebody calls the operator. Operator answers, and say, and the person that's calling says, "Give me room three four five. The operator pulls out a plug and plugs it into 345 uh, and, and the phone in room 345 rings and so that connects the caller with the with 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 the particular room that they want. Well it's kind of the same thing with computers. Uh, an application listens on a particular port. Message comes to the virtual machine and it's placed on this particular port and then the application gets that message. And standard applications have assigned ports. So you can find a list in Wikipedia or elsewhere. Uh, for example, if you're doing HTTP, it's, it's 80. If you're doing HTTPS, uh, now I'm guessing I think it's 243. But in any case, the, the, these are known numbers. Uh, so I, the distinction, IP addresses and ports are different and they're both important. IP addresses say where on the internet the computer lives, whether it's virtual or real. These are machine specific and they're controlled by the IP portion of TCP IP. A port describes how to rest, route a message to a particular application. These are application uh, specific and they're specified in the TCP part of the TCP IP. So you will see references to C TCP IP protocol and what that means is that you are using the TCP protocol on top of the IP protocol. There are other protocols that exist for various purposes, but TCP IP is the dominant one for any kind of web-based thing. Okay, so if we look at, at the TCP protocol, what we see is there's a source port number and a destination port number, okay, and other stuff too. It gets broken up into chunks, and so that's why you have a sequence number so that uh, you can put the chunks back together into a sequential list. If you have two applications that list in, on the same port, then a message destined for one application may get sent to another, so that's not a good thing. So there's a concept called port forwarding, which is like phone call forwarding, in the sense that you send a message to a particular port, and it is told to forward that message to a different port on the destination computer. So applications listen on a particular port, but they may need to listen on a different port because of this contention problem. And so you can parameterize applications or you can change applications to see which port they listen on. So to summarize, IP addresses tell the network how to route a message to get it to a particular computer. Uh, domain name system uh, translates URLs, the, the names, the character names um, that you put in your browser to IP addresses. And ports are a means for routing messages within a particular computer.